There we go. All right, so welcome everybody back to day four of the Writer's Workshop. Today we will actually be talking about writing the actual story. So for the past three days, we've kind of been going all over the place. We've talked about how to do a plot hill. We've learned some techniques. We learned how to put it into a slideshow, which was super fun. And today we are kind of just gonna take everything that we've learned over the past three days and kind of compile it into like actually writing the story, which is the funnest part, I guess, of creative writing. So here is today's agenda. We actually have a lot to get through today, so hopefully we can go through it all. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about the difference between a short story and a novel. There's a few differences. There are a ton of similarities, so we're just going to go through that. Um, next, we're going to talk about how to start a short story, plus a few examples that I found off of my old Google Drive. Um, next, we're going to talk about the elements to the first chapter of a novel, plus another few examples. Um, and then we're going to go into dialogue, which if you don't know what that is, that's okay. We're going to cover that today. And then after that, we will do a mini dialogue practice kind of thing. And then at the end, we will share slideshows, which is what some of you guys requested um, yesterday. So if you guys want to share your slideshows, definitely just have that ready and I'll enable screen sharing and you can just share it once we get to the end of today. And also, here's a little side note, a lot of the info covered today will show up on the Kahoot tomorrow. So yes, we are gonna play another Kahoot. Hopefully, you guys are all familiar with how that works by now. So definitely pay attention if you guys wanna take notes. Today's, again, more of a note-taking day, I guess, because it's gonna be more on the technical side. So if you do wanna take notes, you can. Here's kind of just a heads up. <laughs> All right, so going right into it, we're gonna talk about a short story versus a novel. So if you guys didn't know, I actually teach more classes um, apart from the Writer's Workshop. In two of those, we're mainly focusing on writing a novel because students kind of take an idea, they write a novel and they publish it. So it's definitely like a long story. Um, but because this Writer's Workshop is a beginning level course, I guess, I definitely don't want to say, okay, you guys have to write a novel because I know a lot of you guys right now, you're writing short stories. So if you're not ready for that, it's totally fine. So I thought just for this class, I go over the differences so you guys can decide which one is right for you and your writing level. So here we go, um, the comparison side by side, the short story is on the left and the long story or novel is on the right. So a short story is usually less than 10,000 words. There's no like specific classification that a short story is a short story. But if you look at, you know, short stories, they're obviously, you know, short. So I would say they're usually less than or around 10,000 words long. And of course, they have less subplots and conflict. It's mostly just focusing on one main conflict. So it's not as confusing and it doesn't have as many subplots. Um, it definitely does have less characters. If you read a lot of long stories, you'll know that they have a ton of characters. Um, and again, it focuses on one main conflict. And this is just a like random estimate. I have no idea like actually how long it takes to complete. But for me to write a good short story, from the beginning brainstorming to the end where it's completely done I would say it takes usually about two weeks to completely finish although of course it's like differs from person to person all right on the other hand for our long story um, these are usually between 10,000 to 100,000 words and I will have like reference points on the next slide um, it has more conflicts and um, subplots everything is kind of more stretched out that's how it kind of makes it between 10,000 and 100,000 words, and a lot more detail is needed. It has many conflicts, and um, I guess here again, it takes usually many months to finish. When I wrote my second book, Nightingale, which is about 55,000 words, it took me about six months to com go from like- the I read the Nightingale yesterday. You did? I, I read it too, it's like a while ago. Wow. <laughs> I already finished it. Yeah, it's about 55k words, I think. It's 55,300-ish words, and that one took me about six months to completely finish, which I guess if you compare it to, like, the median or average amount of time, it's actually on the shorter end because, I mean, I was writing full-time because we didn't have that much school, so I would say on average to write, like, a novel, I would say it usually takes around a year if you're going to start, like, brainstorming it and take it all the way to publication, although, of course, it's, like, differs from person to person. I read it too. All right, that's super cool. All right, um, and then moving on to the word count, which I kind of promised you guys I would give you some reference points. So most novels are in between 50,000 to 120,000 words. Novellas are kind of like mini novels. They're kind of uh, longer than a short story, but not as long as a novel. These are usually between 10,000 to 50 thousand words. Um, here's an example of Harry Potter. Uh, it's about 77,000 per book. I think this one was the length of the Sorcerer's Stone, which is the first book. Although, you know, like in the middle, like the 
fifth and the sixth book, it gets a lot thicker. Um, Diaries of Gold Rush, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, you guys didn't see it in print because it was, I didn't um, publish it in print, but it's about 8,000 words or 9,000 words. And when I printed it, it was about 1.5 centimeters thick and I was actually gonna grab it, but I forgot. <laughs> so I guess it's about like this thick if you like actually measure it in print. Um, Nightingale, as I just mentioned, was about 55, thousand words and I know a lot of you guys got in print so you know how thick it is but I would say that's about an inch or so thick so that's just some reference point. All right so writing the first chapter how do you actually start writing this story but before we talk about that let's talk about why it's important in the first place so why is the first chapter important well there's obviously many reasons but mainly because it's your reader's first impression of you and your writing if they read the first chapter and they realize that your writing's not that great they probably won't let be less likely to read any of your work in the future it also sets the tone for the entire book so I'd say if you guys read Nightingale, you'll know it's very dystopian, it's pretty dark, so the first chapter naturally should match that tone. If in the first chapter I talked about like unicorns and like rainbows and all that happy stuff, and then in the second chapter there's a lot of like dark things and it probably won't make that much sense. So it does definitely set the tone for the entire book. And um, like I mentioned before, it's kind of the critical point where readers decide whether to read on or discard it. So I'm not sure if your teachers have told you this in school, um, where they kind of talked about the hook, which I'll talk about later today as well. But they're like, the hook is the most important because the hook is the first sentence. Um, they always say the hook is the most important because readers read the first line and if they don't like it, they just won't read on. But in reality, that's kind of false. It usually takes about a chapter for a reader decide, to decide whether they want to read on or just discard the book. The hook is definitely important. And again, I'll talk about that in a few slides. But overall, it takes kind of the entire chapter for you to set the tone and for your readers to decide whether they want to read on or just throw it away. All right, so now let's talk about the first chapter of a short story. So technically, these aren't first chapters. Um, I guess in a short story, they are more classified as paragraphs. So I'm just going to call it the first paragraphs. So starting a short story is pretty easy. All you kind of have to do is introduce the characters. The whole point of a short story is that it's, you know, short, so you definitely don't have to spend that much time on the first chapter. Um, you don't need to spend that much time on putting in details and wor world building, which I'll also talk about later. And here are some examples. All right, so I found this one. Uh, this is of Roxy's Arctic Fox, as you guys can probably see, but I wrote this in fifth or sixth grade, I believe. So I actually found this in like my Google Drive. It was in there from like a bunch of years ago. But this is an example of how I started this short story. So I guess I'll just read it through real quick. In the kingdom of Zarsin, Kion was a greatly feared goddess. She was a goddess of snow. All the animals of the north, well, I guess they lived in the north, feared her and worshipped her. She ruled the Arctic by herself and she had all the power. Nobody tried to stop her and missing a space there. And one day she noticed how lonely she was and decided she wanted a child. She created two clay statues of Arctic foxes and put them in the first ray of sunshine. A few days later, two Arctic foxes were welcomed into the cold world, which, surprise, surprise, is our um, main character and his sister. So obviously, as you can see, it's not the most detailed, and that's like okay because it's a short story. Um, in like the first sentence, we pretty much know the first character. In the first two paragraphs, we pretty much know the second few characters. So again, it just goes straight into it. It doesn't take that much like details or conflicts before introducing the actual characters. Here's another example of a short story that I wrote around the same age. So I did a lot of short story writing when I was about fifth grade. So this one is, I believe, called Leaves, and I wrote it from the point of view of a leaf. Well, I guess a maple leaf. I don't really remember, but it's the same concept of a short story beginning. So we have a gentle breeze ruffled the leaves on an old maple tree hanging in, well, no, on an old maple tree in the backyard belonging to a family of four. A set of twin boys and parents, Sophie the leaf hung on tightly to the branch of the tree to avoid being blown off like her friend Stara. Yeah, I was kind of obsessed with names, as you can probably see. <laughs> All right, Sophie ha also had a brother named Jack. Meanwhile, the twin boys were throwing around an old baseball in the backyard. And then we have some dialogue here, and it, yeah, we have Sophie sighed and let herself sit back, listening to the conversation. A minute later, she was shattered out of her daydream by an ear piercing scream. Later, she discovered coming from her aunt Percy. So as you can see, it's the same concept, of course, different story, 
but I added some imagery here in the beginning, but then of course in sentence two, I introduced the main character. So you kind of already know what the story is basically gonna be about. All right, this is another example. This is not written by me. It was written by one of my students in I think my first, the first time I taught this class. So he, um, his story was about a king, as you can probably see. And when he actually started writing, this was his first few sentences. So it reads, once upon a time, there is a kingdom ruled by a king. The king's very selfish. He won't give his men any gold. He just wanted to be the richest person in the world. He doesn't really care about the residents in his kingdom and all of the citizens or people in his kingdom hate him. So um, as you can, if you compare this to like the previous two, it's a lot less detail, which is kind of why it's so short. Um, if you, if this person wanted, he could have probably put a lot more detail into it and kind of describe a lot more, but he just went straight into it, which I guess is kind of fine because it's a short story. So there need be like that many details, but that's basically how you start a short story. So moving on to the first chapter of a long story or a novel. So starting a novel, as you can imagine, is a bit more difficult because there is so many things that you have to consider. And I'm not gonna talk about them all because honestly, I can I don't even know like all the elements you have to consider. There's just so many things. So I just compiled a few elements um, into the first story or a few, I compiled a few elements that technically should be in the first chapter in the next few slides. Um, but yeah, starting a novel is more difficult. You definitely have to space out your characters. And at the same time, you have to make sure not to overload your readers with information or else it would kind of be like an info dump. And there's also many elements to the first chapter of a novel, such as a hook. So I kind of described this already at the beginning, but a hook is basically an opening statement, which is usually the first sentence in a book that attempts to grab the reader's attention. So if you're reading a book, um, the hook is always going to be either the first sentence usually, or it can even range for like the first paragraph. So how do I come up with the one? Well, there's many different ways. Um, you can use a quote from a famous person. You could use a meaningful sentence. You could um, use imagery showing or not telling, or you can even um, ask a question in second person, which would technically be breaking the fourth wall, but there are kind of exceptions to that. So the second element is, well, element is kind of just to follow your main character or protagonist. All right, so again, follow your main character or protagonist, whoever you kind of introduce first, that's who your readers will follow. So obviously this is kind of one of the main differences between a short story on, and a novel. If you remember when I kind of showed the first chapter of the Roxy the Arctic Fox story, I started by introducing Kayone. So she's obviously not the main character, but again, that's a short story. If I did the same thing in a novel, then readers will tend to get a bit more confused, especially as, you know, in a novel, usually the main characters are introduced first. Um, around here is also when you should start considering your point of view and tense. Are you going to write in first person? Are you going to write in third person? If so, limited or omniscient. Usually you shouldn't write in second person unless you're doing like a choose your own adventure book. All right, um, question here, what if I want to start with the villain, which is the antagonist? Well, usually if you want to do that, it takes the form a, of a prologue rather than an actual first chapter. So usually prologue starts with the antagonist or even just a side character. And in most cases, it actually is kind of a history lesson of the world that your readers are going to be brought into as they actually get into the first chapter. Um, sometimes it starts decades before your main character is born and its main purpose is to either introduce the villain first to provide some like depth into the story before they even start reading it or again just like world build in like the prologue so you don't have to do as much world building in the first few chapters. And speaking of world building, um, our next element is to introduce some normal life and world building. And I see Olivia, do you have a question? When you mean the prologue, like for the villain, I didn't add a prologue in my story, so like, or in my slide, because like we didn't talk about it back then. So like, when we make our story like today or like tomorrow, can we like add a prologue, even though we didn't add it in like our story plot or like slideshow? Yeah, that's totally fine. I mean, everything in creative writing, it's super tentative. Like you can have a plot hill, and I know a lot of my students in the past, they made a plot hill, but their final story turned out completely different. So I guess I forgot to mention that before, but everything you pretty much do in this class, you can always change it later on. If you want to add a chapter, if you want to add a character, take out a character, you can totally do that. And I've got a prologue isn't necessarily like 100% like necessary. Um, in most cases, you technically should start with your main character, but if you want to do a prologue, then definitely you can add it in once we actually start writing, if that makes sense. 
All right, so going back to world building, world building um, is exactly what it sounds like. You're basically building a world. And in most cases, this applies more to fantasy and dystopian writers because in contemporary and like mystery thriller, it usually takes place in present day. So obviously, you don't have to describe to your readers how like lights work or how cars drive because we all live in the same world and they should kind of know that already. And on the other hand, in fantasy, you're basically coming up with your own world. You can come up with your own laws, your own like magic systems. So in that case, you should technically do some world building or info dumping on your readers so they actually know what's happening because obviously they don't live in your character's world. So um, on the same kind of page, give a brief or emphasis on brief snapshot of their life. And again, especially in fantasy and dystopian, um, here are just some things that you can, can consider while world building. Um, you can consider the routine. I know I read a lot of dystopian books where they place an emphasis on the main character's routine. For example, like in your fantasy world, do they go to school? If they don't go to school, then what do they do? Um, do they brush their teeth? Maybe in like your story, they don't even have teeth. So they're just some things that you can consider while world building. Um, you can also consider uniforms. I know I've read a lot of um, dystopian books where everyone wears the same clothing, um, hairstyle, kind of the same thing as like physical appearance. All right, so the next one is to introduce the problem or the conflict and add action. All right, so um, we brought back our little plot hill plot diagram here just to reference. And I guess the conflict in the first chapter should technically be the inciting incident slash conflict right here. So again, the inciting incident, just as the refresher, it's the point where the drama kind of unfolds, it kicks off all the action. So in the first chapter, you definitely don't want it to be boring. I kind of, well, I didn't talk about it yet, but in my other class, I definitely covered that a lot. So you definitely don't want your first chapter to be boring because nobody got time to read through boring stuff. So definitely add some conflict, add some action. And so the main question here, what is going on in the main character's life and how do I actually represent that in my first chapter? And of course, what sparks the setting incidents, it should technically make sense. Characters do things for a reason as we kind of, um, talked about back in day one. All right, also add some action. I'm a huge fan of adding a lot of action into my first chapters with the exception of my first book because that was written like five years ago. <laughs> but if you read Nightingale and the book I'm working on right now, in the first chapter, there's is usually a lot of things happening, whether it be a flashback like for Nightingale or in my book that I'm writing right now, I'm totally giving you guys spoilers, but there is a giant fight scene that happens in the first chapter. So um, definitely I'm not a fan of uninteresting events. I know a lot of writers have trouble like starting with action. That's kind of why they resort to using dream sequences, which you should definitely not do. I'm sure your teachers have told you that. Um, so definitely stay away from uninteresting events, add some action, but don't make it like a false reality, like a dream action sequence, because nobody likes that. So again, if your story starts at the end of the day or like after the last period of school, don't start the book with the main character waking up because it's not that relevant to this story. So basically start where the story begins and how do I know where the story begins? It's where the action and conflict first happens. So a common question here, what do I do if I have more than one conflict? Um, there is kind of like a lot of confusion here, so I'll just clarify real quick. A subplot does not equal the main conflict. We didn't talk too much about subplots, um, but each subplot is basically a mini plot that is kind of intertwined into your main plot, and each subplot kind of has its own mini conflict. So you can have as many subplots as you want. Um, usually, well, I, I know I have a ton of subplots, but usually in long stories and novels, there are a ton, whereas in short stories, there aren't as many. So you can have as many as you want, but the main conflict should remain the same. And I don't think I used this example yet, but <laughs> one example that I usually use to explain this is Harry Potter. So hopefully you guys have all been um, familiarized with that series. So basically in Harry Potter, of course, there is one main conflict, which is defeating the Dark Lord, which is Voldemort. So that is the main conflict that is carried through the entire series. And if you recall, at the end of each book, there is its own mini conflict. So for example, book one, the Sorcerer's Stone, they have to defeat the Sorcerer's Stone. In the fourth book, the Triwizard Tournament, um, Harry has to kind of go through that. Um, and so on and so on. So of course those would count as like mini subplots, but ultimately throughout the entire series the main conflict stays the same, which is to defeat Voldemort. So point four is to make the reader care, which is kind of 
ties into what we just talked about. So this is kind of why we introduced the problem to evoke empathy. So when you're a writer, this is something that you definitely should go for to kind of make your readers feel something. Because if they read through your entire book and they don't really resonate with that at all, then it probably won't be that great, I guess. <laughs> so definitely do get your readers invested. And how do I do this? Well, the easiest way is probably making your characters relatable. So um, I guess this is kind of, well, this, well, technically it's like easy, but when you're actually creating characters, it can be hard to think of character flaws just because, you know, when we create characters, we kind of want them to be perfect. But remember, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm sure you've heard that before somewhere. And everybody kind of has flaws. So when you're creating characters, definitely make them have strengths, make them have weaknesses. That's like the easiest way to kind of evoke empathy within your readers. So next, we're going to go on to a few examples. So um, of course, it is kind of hard to find the first chapter of a novel because one, I'm not going to type out the entire first chapter of the Harry Potter series into a slide. That would take forever and it would probably not even fit on a slide. So my examples are both from, well, my, there's two examples and they're each from my books, which is the Gold Rush and Nightingale. So um, just keep in mind that this is not the complete chapter. This is kind of just the first paragraph of the first chapter. All right, so this one is from Diary of the Gold Rush. I'm not sure if you guys have read that, but for background information, I wrote this in fourth grade um, and I published it in fifth grade. So I guess I was about the same age as you guys. So I'm um, just reading through it real quick. It says, my name is Katrina and I'm eight years old. Don't know why there's a hype in there. I'm walking in and wearing out shoes in the desert. Um, have you guessed where I'm going? If you've guessed the California Gold Rush, you are exactly right. I'm on my way to California in hopes of striking it rich. Right now, I'm walking in sandals along the desert with my dad and my very annoying 12-year-old brother. <laughs> my mother didn't come along, blah, 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 just before I left. Um, my mother came up to me, gave me this journal. I'm pretty hungry and thirsty. It's only 5 p.m., and it kind of just explains her setting. So again, this is like the first paragraph in the first chapter, and this is also what young writers tend to do, which is in the first sentence, just introduce the main character. And honestly, that's okay. Like, as you can see, like I did it here, and in a lot of novels, it just goes ahead and introduces the first character. But if you'll see in my next example, which is Nightingale, I did, a lot more dif dif I did it a lot more differently. I didn't even introduce the main character until like later chapters. So. This is the first chapter of Nightingale. If you read it, it probably looks pretty familiar. I would suppose so. Um, but for those of you who haven't, here's kind of a sneak peek into the first chapter. So it starts with saying, I suppose I should be used to the roaring sounds of drones by now. After all, they're always hovering above us, watching us, waiting for a wrong move. But I could never shake the feeling of impending doom as they flew by. I've lived in Tier 4 long enough to know the horrors that came with the drones. So naturally, when the vibrations in the air signaled the Arrival of another one, I slipped inside, clapped my hands over my ears, curling up against the wall, my knees pressed up against my chest, blah, blah, blah. I hummed the melody of an old lullaby, but as always, it wasn't enough. And as the drone flew closer, the roaring sound easily engulfed the feeble attempts I had made to drown out the noise. Within seconds, I was flung back into the past, right into a memory that I so wished I could forget. And then, of course, this is just the first paragraph. If you keep on reading, there's a giant flashback, which you guys probably remember if you read the book. So anyway, so this is the first um, paragraph. As you can see, I did not do the same thing as I did with uh, Diary of the Gold Rush. You know, basically know nothing about the main character, although this is talking from her point of view. You don't know her name. You don't know, well, yeah, you don't even know it's a she, but <laughs> you don't know the main character. You don't know what they look like. You don't know how old they are or basically anything about them. A few things that you do know, though, um, you know they live in Tier 4, which is kind of the setting, so I kind of included it. Um, we know the conflict, well, the initial conflict. We know that the main character is probably scared of the drones that are coming, and that's kind of what the entire paragraph is talking about. But you don't actually get to know the main character until later. So, again, there's so many ways to start a chapter, and these are just some examples from my own personal writing. So the big, I guess, thing to remember here, short story or novel, it's really up to you. There's like no right or wrong. I know when I first started writing, I didn't, well, I wrote one for short story before I wrote my first book. But I know for many others, they write so many short stories. They write like 20-ish before they attempt writing a novel. So it's honestly up to you. Um, if you want to go for it, go or you think you can kind of write a novel and go for it. Um, if you think I'm not that ready yet, I think I should just stick to short stories. That's totally fine too. 
All right, so now let's talk about what not to do. Some common traps and cliches that you should probably best stay away from. All right, so the first one, of course, fairy tale beginnings, which is so common in young writers. I can't believe you guys, I did the exact same thing when I was younger. But as you get older, you should probably stay away from these just because they are so cliche. So here are just some examples. Once upon a time, you know, every Disney movie starts with it and they don't need any more books that do. Can't avoid it. Yes, Can't avoid, avoid that. it if you're actually writing a fairy tale. Yeah, unless if you actually are writing a fairy tale, then I guess you could use these because that's kind of a trope in them. But if you're writing dystopian, then you should probably not start with Once Upon a Time. So, yeah, if you're writing a fairy tale, that's like another story. But if you're not, which in the most cases you aren't, then you should probably generally stay away from all these cliches. So the next one is a long, 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 long time ago. There lived a king and a queen and a prince and a princess and so on. Stay away from that one too. Um, this one's kind of similar. Once there was, once there lived. Um, far away and just as long ago. So if you Google fairy tale beginnings, there's going to be a huge giant list that pops up. But anyway, just stay away from these. Unless you're writing fairy tale, which I guess you technically should stay away from them at all costs, but it depends on like the um, genre, of course. So here's some more rookie mistakes. Um, starting off with the dream sequence. I kind of explained this one already. I'm sure your teachers have told you never start out with a dream sequence. Um, I don't know if they told you why, but basically the reason why you should not start with a dream sequence is because one, there's usually a lot of action here, which is good for the reader, but once you start, and then once you end the dream sequence by, and then my alarm went off, or, and then I woke up, then it kind of breaks the reader out of the trance, and they're kind of like, why did I read an entire chapter about fighting when it's not even relevant to the main character? So just stay away from dream sequences. Um, if you want to add action, which you should, just make it real action and not in a dream. Um, the next one is a main character waking up and being late for school. And I got a chat that's asking what is a dream sequence. So a dream sequence is basically when the character is dreaming and you're kind of describing what's going on in that dream. So generally, there's a lot of action, but again, if you want to include action, make sure it's actually happening and not just not happening in a dream, if that makes sense. All right, so the next one is um, main character waking up being late for school. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Wattpad or not, but I've been on there for some time, and every single young adult contemporary fiction novel, with the exception of like 5% of them, begins with the main character waking up, looking at the clock, and realizing that he or she is late for the first day of school. So obviously, this is really overused. I mean, I guess you could use it, but there are so many better ways to start a novel, so just don't, just don't st stay away from, like, everything here. All right, the next one is weather. So actually, I've seen this a lot more than I technically should have, um, because weather is mainly just describing imagery or saying the sun shone really brightly this day and I saw the light rays flashing through my window and so on and so on. So again, it's not like a bad thing to start with. I've read a lot of really good books that start with a lot of imagery, but generally there are a lot better ways to start and of course you can include a lot more conflict and action and I'm sure there are more ways to include action instead of just listing out the weather. Um, the next one is gazing into a mirror and actually this isn't that common in the first sentence. This is mostly common in the first um, chapter, but this is kind of its own trope. So actually this is more an advanced writing for beginners or it doesn't really matter. But when you're introducing what your character looks like, just, um, I guess you could do this, but just don't have them look into a mirror. Don't have them walk by a lake and then describe what they look like. There's like a lot more ways to describe what they look like instead of them staring into a mirror because that's kind of like an amateur mistake, I guess. So. Um, I think tomorrow I'll talk more about like alternative ways to do this, but also, well, you guys are too young to have social media technically, but um, I'll probably make a post or send you guys an email about all the other ways you could start a novel without using all of these rookie mistakes. So, all right, it's been half an hour. So now we're going to move on to our dialogue mini lesson. So if you guys don't know what dialogue is, it's basically a conversation it can be either spoken, so two people talking to each other, or internal, which is kind of just talking to that voice inside your head by a character. So external dialogue is always, always presented in double quotes. Um, that's what it looks like. If you don't know where it is, press shift and hit the key to the left of your return key on your keyboard, and it should pop up something like that. 
Um, internal dialogue is usually presented in italics. Um, you can kind of format that on Google Docs or you can press Command I, it should shift it to italics. Um, but this is not necessarily always the case. Some internal dialogue can be presented in single quotes or, but just remember external is always double and the safe bet for internal is just put it in italics. Um, as for formatting, there are so many rules to follow. Like, I'm just not going to go through them all because it's just so much to remember. So the main thing is just watch the commas and periods, which I'll kind of explain in the next slide, and also start a new line each time a character speaks. So actually, I was going through you guys' homework that you guys kind of did yesterday and the day before that and the day before that, and some of you guys actually started writing your first chapter. So that's great. It's really cool to see. But again, um, well, this isn't like common knowledge, but when you're writing, make sure when you have dialogue, when you have people talking, start a new line. And honestly, like we've read so many books that it doesn't seem like not, it doesn't seem like doing anything or it doesn't seem weird. But when you're actually writing, it kind of is weird just pressing a new line every time a character speaks. But once you're going, it's better to do it now when you're writing it, then finish it and then go back and having to change everything. So here's an example of well-formatted dialogue. Um, I tried my best to write an interesting conversation, but it's pretty generic. But the formatting is correct, so I guess just focus on that. So um, my first line of dialogue, Bob is saying, hi, Sam, Bob called. Um, Sam replies with hello. So I guess here you can kind of see I used a comma instead of a, well, let's pretend that's a period. So if it's a, well, if it's a phrase that's continued, then you should use a comma. Um, but if it's just a sentence in the um, quote, then you use a period. So that is super confusing, but I don't, I honestly don't know how to explain it that well. So I guess just like kind of read books and see how like they format their dialogue or you can just reference that as well. Um, so Sam replies, hello, um, what are you up to today? Bob shrugged and of course this new dialogue. So you press enter. Not much. He paused for a minute, then turned to Rick, who stood next to him. What about you, Rick? So this is uh, punctuation two. And then Rick says, same here. And I guess some more terminology clarification. These things like to, well, that you write after the dialogue, they're actually called dialogue tags. And in most cases, you use them to kind of clarify who's talking. So if you just said, hi, Sam, and then Bob called would be the dialogue tag. But in most cases, well, in most cases, you should have them, but sometimes you don't even need to have them if you've clarified them already. So I kind of use that example here where he asked, what about you, Rick? So because he's kind of inferring that it's Rick talking, in the next one, I didn't say, same here, Rick replied, because the reader should know that it's Rick talking, so I don't have to say that again. So a question in the chat, do we have to press tab? Well, that's mostly to indent. So if you guys want to indent your paragraphs, which technically you should be doing, um, but generally just press enter and that should kind of take it to a new line. And Olivia, do you have a question too? When you're writing your story, are you gonna use the normal font or can you use like a different font? All right, so for fonts, for now, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to be actually publishing the story that you're writing right now, I suppose. If you guys do want to publish your book, definitely sign up for my other classes because they go over formatting. But for me, I always write in Times New Roman 12-point font double spaced, be just because that's the standard for publishing. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of writers who like to write in like Comic Sans or this nice handwriting font, which is what I did when I wrote Diary of the Gold Rush. But um, if you want to do that, you totally can. And for me, I just prefer to write in Times New Roman because it just looks a lot more organized and I just like it that way. But for now, since probably this isn't the final story that you're going to be publishing, if you want to publish, you don't have to worry too much about like how it looks if that makes sense. Wait, um, what is your other class called? Okay, so my other class is called, oh wait, I have to explain this again. <laughs> All right, so I, I have two other classes apart from this one I'm teaching right now, which is Writer's Workshop. So I teach a class called Planning and Plotting. I abbreviate it as PNP. And basically in that class, we talk about outlining. So I kind of brushed upon it like in this class as well. But in that class, we go like in depth. We talk about the three act structure. We talk about magic systems. We talk about all that stuff. And then basically the goal of that class is for you to kind of develop a story to continue in the road to publication class, which is my other class. It's abbreviated as RTP. And basically in that class, you take the story idea that you've kind of outlined and planned in the plotting and planning class and you write it and you publish it. So at the end of 10 weeks, 
you should be able to, you know, publish the book that you wrote. So more information on that, um, you can ask your parents. I mean, I've sent so many, so much stuff to them, but I'll also cover that tomorrow with the registration links. So yeah, I'll just cover that stuff tomorrow, but that's kind of just a sneak peek about the other classes that I host. So I guess going back to this, all right, tips for writing dialogue, um, put yourself into the character's shoes. So this can be kind of hard, I guess, but you really have to pretend that you are the character. You have to talk in their voice, which can be challenging if you have many characters. That's kind of why you have to develop their personality so you know how they would technically talk. And also you should include some actions instead of just saying Bob said, Sam replied, um, I don't know, Mary um, asked, and just generic stuff like that. Um, here are just some actions that your characters could be doing while they're talking. They include frowning, blushing, they could be twisting their hair, they could be biting their lip, they could be um, shifting, um, they could be like jumping up and down, they could be doing a lot of things. But just keep your dialogue tags interesting, just don't be super generic. Um, also keep the conversation flowing, don't make it super choppy. This is kind of similar to the first one, which is just put yourself into the character's shoes, kind of talk in their voice, keep it realistic, and if you're having trouble with this, talk it out. I know this can be super awkward, but just something that I did while writing Nightingale, because I mean I'm an only child so I don't have siblings and my parents probably don't want to have a conversation with me talking in my character's voice. So I just like sat next to a wall and I talked to the wall for like a straight hour trying to develop my character's voice. So that's kind of super awkward, but if you're having trouble developing your character's voice and their personalities, or just have, or, or if you're having trouble keeping dialogue flowing and kind of keeping it realistic, you could just pretend, we'll talk to a wall, talk to your phone, talk to somebody. If you have siblings, talk to them. If you have friends, well, hopefully you guys have friends, but talk to your friends if they want to talk to you. Um, so that's just another way to kind of um, write better dialogue. So now it's 4.37 for me, so we can spend a little time on this. Um, we can do some dialogue practice. So I didn't write another example tag, but basically this is similar to the imagery one that we did back in day two, I believe. So on the left, um, we have a prompt. So for this one, it's write a conversation between two friends having an everyday conversation. And then on the right is the actual conversation. So this is the example slide. Um, I think this one was written by my class that I taught this well, my second, the second time I taught this class. So um, they're saying, hey, Bob, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? My favorite is mint chocolate chip. Oh, that's cool. Mint is okay, I guess. My favorite flavor is haagen strawberry, which I love also. Strawberry and mint is so much better. Well, anyways, I like to have sprinkles on top of my ice cream. How about you? Well, sprinkles sounds good, but I prefer M&Ms on mine. So honestly, talking about food gets me hungry. But anyway, so that's just an example of dialogue. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so now I think I have two or three more prompts that we're just going to go ahead and try to write a conversation up. So the next one is write a conversation between two friends arguing. So I think my classes have the most fun on this prompt because who doesn't love drama? All right, so does anyone want to give me a scenario um, where or when or why would two friends be arguing? Or what is something that they would be arguing over? Presents? Yep, presents. All right, so we just had Christmas. Um, hopefully you guys had a great Christmas. But you know, Christmas, everybody's giving gifts, everybody's receiving gifts. So that's the perfect opportunity to argue over something. So does anyone want to give me two character names that can be super generic? Um, Mary? Mary, all right. Okay, and he said Sam and Ethan. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to use Mary and Sam because I can just remember that. So, all right, so now we have the topic presence, we have our characters. So what exactly is the conflict? Like, did Mary give Sam something he doesn't want? Did Mary forget to give Sam a gift? Or like, what's going on? Why are they arguing? They're arguing which presence better. Yeah, they're arguing which presence better. All right. So we could say, well, we can have Sam talking first. He would say, Mary, what did you get for Christmas? I got the best presents. All right. What is a present that Sam could have received that he loves? Um, a Lego police station? Sure. Don't make it, don't make it, um, like, don't even say what it is. Don't even say what it is. All right. That should be fun. Okay. So he could say, I got the best presents. What 
about you. All right, and then of course we have a quote. Just make sure you have, because it's a conversation, it's external, make sure you have quotes. And then of course it's a new line, so I pressed um, return or enter that key, whatever you want to call it. All right, so what should Mary say in response to Sam? Wait, sorry, say that again. <laughs> All right, I think I got something in the chat. Yeah, what did you get? So Mary would probably reply to Sam first, of course, because he's kind of asking, what about you? And she could have say, or yeah, I bet my present is better than yours. You could say, really? Well, I bet my present is better than yours. And okay, let's actually give Mary a gift. So what is something that Mary received for Christmas? A doll. A doll, all right. Does anybody okay, many dolls then. Many dolls, actually. Yeah, many dolls. Does anyone want to give a specific brand? I don't know what's popular within you guys nowadays. I said many dolls. Oh, many dolls? All right, we could say, I got many dolls. Dolls. <laughs> I got many dolls from my parents for Christmas. All right, and then we're back to Sam. So now we can actually start initiating the um, argument. So uh, Sam starts by saying, what did you get for Christmas? I got the best ones. What about you? Mary replies by saying, really? Well, I bet my present is better than yours. I got a lot of dolls from my parents for Christmas. And then what should Sam say in response to this? Oh, I got a message in the chat. He could say, it's boring. Dolls are for babies. <laughs> All right, I got a whole train station. I got a whole train station. Oh, say I got a Lamborghini. All right, a Lamborghini, all right. I got a whole train station and a brand new, that is not- A real car? He doesn't even have his license yet. I don't know, maybe- on that's drive? I don't know. I mean, technically, you can drive a golf cart without a license. <laughs> that is true. You can drive a golf cart. I mean, I've never tried, but that sounds interesting. Technically, you can drive when you're 16, but hopefully, when you're 16, you won't be having this kind of argument with people. So, I guess in this case, let's raise the legal age of driving down to about 10, which is kind of dangerous, but it works in this scenario. All right, so Sam replies by saying, this is boring. Dolls are for babies. I got a whole train station and a brand new Lamborghini, which costs like a whole lot of money, but it's fine. All right, now Mary is has to reply to the snarky comment by Sam. How should she reply to this? All right, in the chat, see whatever. All right, so she could say whatever. I don't care about cars. It's not like- Got a private jet. Wow, these are expensive presents, you guys. <laughs> All right, you can say it's not- uh, No, I got a rocket. I got a space rocket. All right, I can say, oh yeah. <laughs> I got a planet for Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, my parents gave me a star for for Christmas. Forgot. But you have, still have to get the five. I got jet. a galaxy for Christmas. Wow. I got. You don't have a rocket. How do you get to the galaxy? Yeah. How, how would you get to the galaxy? I don't know. Maybe you could travel through a wormhole. That would be interesting. Anyway, so you could say, "Oh yeah, I forgot. I also got a SpaceX rocket for Christmas." <laughs> oh my god, these are really expensive gifts. Their parents must be. And awesome. a private jet. All right. <laughs> And a private jet. All right, we're having too much fun thinking of Christmas presents now. But hopefully you guys are learning some dialogue. So I guess as a review, we have our tags. We have, no, these are quotes. We have tags. You know what, I'm going to add a tag here. So. You said to keep it realistic, but none of these presents are realistic. That is true. Unless I guess your dad is Elon Musk, which would be super cool. But I mean. It's fine. Let's just pretend this is a fantasy world. Anything possible. <laughs> All right. So we have Mary. No, we have Sam talking. We have Mary talking. 
we have Sam again, and then we have Mary explain. All right, so I'm actually gonna cut off this conversation here just because we're gonna run out of time. But okay, this wasn't an exact argument, but we do have some disagreements going on, I guess. So it's fine. I am not the best at writing confrontation scenes either. So let's just move on to the next one. All right, this one's also interesting. Write an internal dialogue for somebody facing their fear. All right, so does anybody want to give me a fear that they may have or just a random fear in general? Spiders. Yep, yeah, spiders. Like right. the big poisonous ones that can like yeah, spiders are nasty. I, I hate spiders. All right, so we have spiders, and all right, should we come up? Should we come up with new characters? Okay, somebody give me another character name that I can use in this one. All right, so I got all right. Annie saying Ethan or right, Jake, so I'm just gonna go with Ethan. And of course, this one is an internal dialogue, so this means the character is talking to him or herself. So we don't need multiple characters. It's just gonna be one person and the voice inside their head. So I'm just going to go with Ethan. So we could say, Ethan walked into his room and screamed. There was a fat, hairy spider perched on his bed. All right, I'm not going to go into detail describing the spider because that's nasty. So we can just bed. Bed. Why don't not you just bed. say, Dad? Why don't you just say Ethan walked into his room and screamed? Here was a fat, hairy spider perched on his bed. He said cutie and petted the spider just after dying. That is an interesting story. If you write that, definitely let me know. I will definitely read it. But in most cases, since technically Ethan is supposed to be scared of the spider, hence the internal fear or facing their fear. So... Considering that Ethan is a semi-normal person, he would probably not attempt to pet a giant hairy spider. And actually, fun fact, this has actually happened to me before. There used to be a huge spider on my bed that was creepy, but anyways. All right, so next let's get to the actual dialogue. So he walked into his room and there was a fat hairy spider perched on his bed. And maybe he could scream, Mom, there is a spider on my bed. Come and kill it. But then, of course, he's facing his internal fear. So that means he has to kind of get over his fear of spiders, which I guess you could say. Um, but then he realized that he was alone, alone in his house. That is like the worst. Alone in his house. His parents had left earlier that evening to go to a, I don't know, fancy restaurants where else can parents go in the evening who knows all right so they're at a fancy restaurant and now he realizes that he's on he ran to run to he ran to get a racket no yeah. he said yo look here's a spider i'm gonna pet it it stung me cool oopsie doopsie i died <laughs> That's pretty dramatic. <laughs> That's like the shortest short story I have ever seen in my life. That's like a solid five sentences. <laughs> but anyways, all right, yeah, bad parents leaving kids home alone. Well, you know, this is how he gets over his fear of spiders. So, all right, then he realized he was home alone. His parents had left earlier that evening to go to a fancy restaurant. Home Alone is a real movie. Yes, Home Alone is a real movie. I actually just watched that a couple days ago. It's a great movie. I remember I was so scared of that movie when I was little, but it's actually a good movie. <laughs> All right, so I'm actually going to put some internal dialogue here using italic. So if you're on Google Docs or Google Slides, this is a little italic thing here, and it basically makes the text slanted. So you could say, darn, my parents aren't here. I'm going to have to... Kill, kill it spider myself with a racket all right do you know i'm gonna have to set it free and i'm gonna let it sting me no i'm gonna put it under my sister's bed no i'm gonna put I, it on my sister's pillow wow i feel bad for your siblings if you have siblings because that's pretty evil but anyways um he's technically facing his fear or you know what i'm just not gonna say kill the spider <laughs> i have to get rid of this spider. Technically, if this happened to me, I would try to put it outside because I don't want to deal with dead spider guts on my bed. So let's just pretend that he is trying to hit the spider with a tennis racket, which is an interesting tool to use. So he could say something like, 
um, bowling. <laughs> he um, grabbed a nearby tennis racket. I've never tried killing a spider with a tennis racket before. That's something on my bucket list now. Um, tennis racket and made his way to the spider. All right. So I'm going to stop right And killed it! Yep, I'm just gonna start writing before I get to the actual death scene of the spider because I'm not the best at writing, you know, killing spider scenes. But anyway, you guys get the idea. Hopefully, this person, Ethan, is facing his internal fear of a spider by realizing his parents aren't here. You know, bad parents, don't leave your kids alone. Um, and then he has to kind of deal with this internal fear and grab a tennis racket and kill the spider, which is probably gonna happen in the next few sentences. All right, last one for today. My parents did leave me at home two times. Wow. One you... without telling me, and the other without telling me they both didn't go were going out. That is terrifying. <laughs> Did you find a spider on your bed? No, but I can FaceTime my mom, so I did. Oh, wow. Well. At least you didn't have a spider. Then you could grab a tennis racket and kind of just swipe it. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Write a conversation between two friends planning a prank. So, all right, I'm kind of getting an idea. We could just branch off of our original ones. Anyone want to come up with a prank idea? I know. Being a spider just... on your sister's bed. A yep. whoopee cushion on the chair. Someone sits on it and they, everyone thinks she farted. Yep. But mayonnaise instead of toothpaste. No. Ooh. You should use, you should use like, um, you know, like there's like a back camera on your car near the trunk. Um, under, like, under the back camera, take like a mini figure, action figure, of Jason and tape it there, so whenever they open their back of can, they see Jason. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> no, what the, no, wait. What if they crash and then like, yeah. Um, or you can just um make them just prank them with a fake popsicle. So like, put soap, cover it up with chocolate, and then give it to them. They'll start having bubbles in their mouth. Wow, those are like evil pranks, guys. <laughs> All right, well. No, no, no. Do, do the, do the, um, put like an action figure in the back of the car. Or like, you can put a spider on the, on, spider in the camera, spider on the camera. Oh, actually, that actually happened to me one time. We have a ring doorbell, and I checked like the activity because it was like suspicious activity, and there was a giant spider crawling up the lens. That was disgusting, but anyways. All right, so. You should put the spider on top of the door for them and when they see it they will scream or you can put glue on the doorknob and their hand will be stuck to it yeah it's kind of like what happened at home alone Her name yeah. you, you can um you can get at the doorknob and then put a bucket of, of water on top of it so when they open it oh. the water just falls on top of it. wow all right those are great pranks well we should have we should have had this class right before april Fool's day because that would have been hilarious but anyways all right i've had so many like prank ideas um, I'm just gonna go with the last one of, oh, wait, I already forgot. So, putting glue on the doorknob and then balancing a bucket of ice water on top of the door, right? <laughs> no, bucket of lava. Lava? Ooh, a bucket of, oh, you're gonna kill that person. <laughs> Get lava! So you can put you a bucket of glue. You can't contain lava, like, in a bucket. It'll just melt it. Yeah, that would be <laughs> challenging, so. Actually, you can't. You can just put it in something that has an extremely high melting point. Or you can just put toilet water in it. Ice cold <laughs> toilet water, what about that? All right, I feel bad for this person that's about to be pranked, but sure, can do that. So, you know what, I'm just gonna ditch the glue and just go with the water because I'm honestly gonna forget. All right, I'm actually not gonna write the prank scene because it says planning a prank, so yay, I don't have to write the actual prank and all the screaming. So, all right, give me two characters again that's kind of discussing this prank. Isabel and Soylent. So you're putting ice cold toilet water too? Apparently, yeah. We're gonna dump a bucket of ice cold toilet water on somebody's head, <laughs> which is interesting. All right, so I think I heard Isabel, and they're just gonna go up because I think a lot of people gave me names. Okay, Isabel and Jake. All right, so those would be the two people that are kind of discussing and give you the name of the unfortunate individual that will be the victim of this prank. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, anyone, any names? If you have an enemy in real life? <laughs> I don't want to name this poor person who's going to get pranked. Yeah, I know, that's sad. All right, we have George or Alice, so I'm just going to say George. I <laughs> like what's in house. Name. <laughs> All right. Like blue ball. Wow. All right. So I'm just gonna go with George because that's the first one I saw. Him. So we have Isabel and. We'll do Fatty. Fatty. All right. Well, that person is really out of luck. He has a bad name and he's about to get framed by toilet water. But anyways, okay. I'll just call him George. All right. So we have Isabel and Jake discussing somehow they have something against this George person and they're playing this prank. All right. So I guess we could start by saying. Hey, um, Isabel, I have a great idea for a prank. Do you want to do it with me? And then we could say, Isabel, friend, blindly. Of course. Oh, what's his name? Jake. Ooh. Can we target? George, he spilled ketchup on me. I don't know. Ketchup on me yesterday, and I have to get revenge. Wow. He spilled acid on me. Wow. Dang, you guys have dark minds. <laughs> I'm too make late. the victim Santa Claus. Yeah, make the victim Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> make the victim you. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, if you guys want to write a story based on this, then go ahead. <laughs> but for now, I'm just going to stick with this. Or, oh my gosh, we're like almost out of time. So I'm just going to rest in this. All right. He spilled ketchup on me yesterday and I have to get revenge. What's your master plan? Ketchup? Yep. He spilled ketchup. I don't really even know how he spilled ketchup. Like, isn't it like non spill? Anyways, he somehow, this George dude managed to spill ketchup. And now. No, do he accidentally. He accidentally tripped me. No, he accidentally touched me. <laughs> he no, do so, do a really stupid reason. Look, he <laughs> accidentally no, ate. I'll just say he, I'll just say. No, he accidentally ate a pickle. Yesterday, he <laughs> looked at me weirdly. And I'm offended. <laughs> he just still looked at me. He what? <laughs> Yesterday he looked at me. <laughs> All right, actually, I've seen a lot of people get offended over the weirdest thing, so I'm just going to say, George looked at me weirdly, and now I'm offended, and I want to spill toilet water on him. All right, so what's your master plan? And then, of course, uh, Jake responds, well, I got this idea yesterday. Yesterday, on the toilet, because the best ideas come on the toilet, for <laughs> toilet water. So you could say something like, my plan is to, I don't know, gather, <laughs> how do you even gather toilet water? Gather toilet water, toilet water, put ice in it, <laughs> fill it, <laughs> on George's <laughs> head. Let me say, Isabel <laughs> laughed out loud. Ah! That's a great plan. <laughs> I'll do it with you. All right, and unfortunately, George is the victim of these two offended people that somehow want to speak. No, it's Santa water. Claus. All right, dang, are you playing a Yeah, maybe get Santa Claus. That would be sad. Okay, anyways. Okay, we literally have one minute left, so I'm not going to change anything right now. But here, here's another idea for a story. So if anyone wants to write a short story based on pranking... Wait, can you copy that and paste it in the chat? I'm going to edit it into All a story right. called Stupid Stories for Stupid <laughs> People. Thanks. Stupid what? All right. Stupid what? Here you go. <laughs> you can, guys can edit that if you want. Just have fun. All right. So next, um, we literally are going over time, but hopefully you guys can stay. All right, so if you want to share your slideshow from yesterday, I think some people mentioned that they want to share. Now is your chance to shine. I think I enabled screen sharing. So does anybody want to share or not? <laughs> All right, someone's saying I don't want to share. That's fine. Does anybody want to share? If not, that's fine. We can just move on to the next slide. 
Are you calling it? And what? He said he was naming it stupid, stupid something. Wow, that's an interesting title though. All right, so I guess going once, going twice, going three times. All right, no one wants to share. That's fine. We're pretty much out of time. Wow, it's already been an hour. So let me just go to presentation mode again and go to the last slide for today. Yay, all right, this slide has 45 slides. All right, anyways, so the homework for today, decide on whether you want to write a short story or, for, or a novel, depending on what we just talked about in class, and start writing the first chapter and or continue developing and outlining your story idea. So since like no one's sharing, I guess, um, I was looking at you guys' homework from yesterday. They all look super great. Hopefully you guys had fun with making the slideshow. So if you want, you can either start getting into writing. If you're not ready, that's fine too. You can continue outlining. But tomorrow, I guess I'll give you, all right, somebody just, sorry. Right. Anyways, so tomorrow we're gonna get into editing and ending the novel or short story. So that's just a heads up. So if you do wanna write it, go ahead. But if you're not ready and you just wanna continue outlining, that's fine too. So any questions from anybody? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, when you mean by start writing your first chapter, do you mean by we have to get our first chapter finished by tomorrow? You don't have to finish the first chapter because, I mean, I don't have a timeline. I just write whenever I want to. And I'm sure, like, you guys have, like, pretty busy schedules. But at least just start writing, start brainstorming, and just get something on the paper. It doesn't have to be, like, a thousand words or anything, just as long as you want it to be, I guess. So there's no, like, limit. Did you check our slideshows? Yeah, I actually checked you guys' slideshows yesterday, or technically, like, before the class. Um, since no one really wanted to share, I'm not going to, like, call anyone out. But they all looked super great. I'm glad you guys had fun with it. You guys did, like, really well. Like, I can't put that much effort into a slideshow. But hopefully you guys had fun with it. And hopefully that will actually help you write, because you can kind of just reference everything that you did in the slideshow. <laughs> and, yeah, Stella took this class a third time. So hopefully you're having fun, though. <laughs> And, all right, I'm totally re revised this whole scene. All right, you're spilling it on Santa's head. That's interesting. <laughs> all right. Yay! <laughs> Anyways, um, I don't want to take you guys for too long. So other than that, if you guys don't have any questions on the homework, um, I'll again send this all to your parents, and I'll probably send it to you guys too. For some reason, I wasn't CCing you guys, but if you guys put an email on the application form or registration form, I'll send it to you guys too. So if you didn't, don't get one, then just check with your parents. They'll definitely receive um, the recording and the actual slideshow, which is what we just went through. Um, but other than that, if you guys don't have any questions, I'll see you tomorrow where we have our final day of the Writers' Workshop. This is going by super fast. But anyway, we'll have a final day of the Writers' Workshop, and I'll also talk a bit about classes that I'll be hosting in the future. So if you actually want to like get into writing and potentially publish and write your own book, then you can totally register for those. But other than that, um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. What do you What are you going to call the prank thingy? The prank one we wrote. You have to give it a name. Yeah. Like, does anyone want to name it? I don't know what to name it. No? Uh, oh. Well, I don't know. I'm not the best at naming things. Maybe you could name it like Poor George. Poor George, because yeah. He's... <laughs> George versus the offended people, or... <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Well, wow, George is very unfortunate, but it's fine. Why, he, why, he, why is he so unfortunate? I don't know. Do you want to write his backstory? <laughs> yeah, he spilled ketchup and looked at them weirdly. <laughs> he spilled ketchup. He was the target of this prank, and he has to because. use a bunch of offended people. Bye. Or, or it can be because he touched them. Because he touched them. Yeah, he could accidentally touch them and then they could get offended all over him. That's a potential story. <laughs>